Okay, slides? Yeah, we can see your slides. That's great. Okay, great. Uh, just before I start, just a quick plug in uh, if uh, Trade Decals Lab is still in the room. Uh, Lisa Lot Carrot in my lab, maybe you can raise your hand, Lisa Lot. She's doing some uh, network analysis and she's looking for some feedback and, and group of people to chat about how to do the best uh, the, the network analysis. So it would be really great if you guys could interact and uh, I mean, and, and, and give her some pointer on maybe some journal club where you guys are all gathering so that she has people to talk with. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk about the, the, the cocaine GWAS and the um, oxy GWAS. Uh, the two U1 that uh, we have started, um, where we are screening animals for addiction like behavior, escalation of intake, uh, policy ratio responding, respond despite adverse consequences, hyperalgesia, irritability like behavior. We're looking at the analgesic effect and tolerance to the analgesic effect of opioids 2, that's for the OxyG was. And we also test uh, uh, the three of the approved treatment for UD for the oxycodone G was. And with the same goal that everybody has. Um, which is finding a genetic variants that predict those behavior. So we have those two uh, uh, large-scale behavioral analysis and the protocol is right there. It's large, complicated. Uh, we do a lot of uh, uh, organ sampling because we created two biobank with it. So I'm going to skip all that really quickly. Uh, where are we at? Well, we're getting there for the cocaine GWAS. We are the four and a half, um, Four and a half years since we started, we're almost at the level of 880 animals that we were hoping for. The oxycodone GWAS will all be behind because we started later, uh, but we're expecting that we are going to uh, reach um, those goals, despite the fact that we had COVID like everybody. And on top of that, we had to move our lab from Scripps to UCSD in the middle. So um, that was um, pretty difficult. So we, we're pretty happy about um, and those achievements. So if you look at the behavior, this has not been updated, I think, since last uh, January, but you, you get the point. Uh, you, you can screen animals for different level of addiction, like behavior. And here we categorize those animals into four subgroup, animals that are resistant or resilient to addiction, like behavior, that will show very low level of a motivation under a progressive ratio, low level of responding under a fixed ratio, low level of responding uh, when uh, the, the intake is paired with food shock, um, and then animals that have the opposite pattern, right? Um, we, we didn't find any relationship with irritability like behavior, which we have found to be a really good marker of with those symptoms, both in mice and rats, and with different drugs, including opioid, alcohol, nicotine, and cocaine. Um, uh, so we're slightly disappointed with that, but you know, it's also nice to have behavior that are orthogonal to the one that you have of interest. So if you do a principal component analysis, you see that they are very orthogonal. Uh, so it's kind of a controlled behavior for us at this point. Um, and so you can see that compulsivity, motivation, and escalation of intake really cluster nicely the same level. We have very good uh, reliability within subject in terms of testing, which means when we test an animal one day, we're expecting to have the same result the next day. Uh, so very high level of uh, correlation here, um, which translates also into a high level of SNP irritability. So you can see in the table at the bottom here, you have a bunch of different behavior and you, we reach SNP irritability that are almost 0.7, almost 0.8 for some of those behavioral traits. Um, interestingly, I mentioned that also later, is we found that um, the behavioral measures that look at the overall behavioral response during the session have much lower SNP irritability than the, the behavioral measure within a session right, in terms of uh, interatrial interval and, and how that the behavior is distributed between the early phase and the late phase of the session. So we think that there are some, some behavioral uh, motives that, that may be more linked to the uh, their, their genetic mechanism than the overall view of your output. So here is uh, a porcupine plot that I mentioned. I'm just going to go very quickly over it because uh, I don't want to uh, take that for granted until we get all the, the animals at the end of the, the funding and, um, and we're missing. So this is about, I think, 400 animals, so roughly 400 animal 500 animals that have been sequenced and we've identified uh, some really really interesting genes uh, aducin 3 
which promotes actin network and cytos cytoskeleton and binds to actin and camodulin. It has been uh, involved also in vasoconstriction and in bipolar disorder, GWAS. Uh, why I'm interested by vasoconstriction? Because um, there has been a lot of work linking vasoconstriction in the brain uh, due to uh, cocaine and the behavior effect of, of cocaine. And so there's uh, some nice studies in human um, led by Nora Volkar, for example, on the role of the vagus constriction in the effect of, uh, of cocaine. So it's very possible that uh, it also affects pharmacokinetic and, and therefore the susceptibility to self-administer cocaine. Uh, we have also max interactor one. This is the repressor of CIMIC, uh, binds RNA polymerase two, has been associated with bipolar disorder. Obviously, when you start messing up with um, and those transcription factors is also related to first June AP1 complex. Um, so uh, that's an interesting uh, protein. We also have a hit with lustin rich repeat node or three, uh, as, as well as an EQTL with it uh, that promotes uh, phosphorylation and synaptic assembly. It's part of the clapping complex, so very important for a release of uh, uh, synaptic vesicles and also uh, a GWAS. Uh, heat in the schizophrenia G was. And then uh, an example of DOC4, which is another EQTL, uh, the dedicator of cytokinesis. Um, this protein enables the PDZ domain by any activity. So this is critical for glutamatergic transmission. You can knock it down, you decrease glutamatergic transmission. It's also involved in vasoconstriction. And the DOC family of proteins has been associated with cocaine dependence uh, in the human G was. Uh, an interesting aspect is the hit so far that we've seen for um, uh, self administration of cocaine under limited access or short access are different than those after long access uh, after um, when you're using intake with food shock, so compressive lack measures uh, of, of cocaine intake. So it's very important for us and really validate the, um, the use of the model here. Uh, we have similar results with oxycodone, where we have, we can classify animals in different subpopulation. With oxycodone, we have also measure of oxycodone-induced analgesia and tolerance to in, in oxycodone-induced analgesia, uh, as well as uh, with all induced hyperalgesia. And you can see that the animals that are the most susceptible uh, of with all induced hyperalgesia are also the one that take the most opioids. So very interesting finding here. Um, some people have claimed that pain has nothing to do with uh, opioid um, use. Um, uh, we tend to disagree based on this data. Uh, also, the, uh, most of the animals show tolerance to the oxycodone-induced analgesia, which is expected. But you can see that the animals that are really resistant in green here, uh, they show in contrast, they show a sensitization of the opioid-induced analgesia. So we think there is a really tight relationship between pain and opioid self-administration. Uh, the uh, oxycodone GWAS, we have a low number of animals so far that hasn't been updated um, yet, but we have already had, even with 230 animals, we already had two hits developing. So we're excited about that. And uh, we, we should have a meeting in about a month, I think, with um, uh, Palmer's group to get the most latest data. Uh, in terms of progress, the, the biobank keep, go, keep going. We have now 43 requests, 22 investigators. Uh, what is great is that, you know, when, that means that investigator, are, the same investigators are coming back to the biobank because they are liking the data they are getting and they are liking the, the, the service. So we are really happy that we have returning customer or call, returning collaborator. Um, and so we, for those who do not know, we, are, we have a bunch of samples. It, at different state, intoxication, withdrawal, abstinence, uh, perfuse, snap frozen. And now we, we started uh, doing brain punching. So we have a protocol uh, that could, you can find, I think, on protocols.io where you are, we're punching, I think, about 20 different brain regions. Um, and so uh, the goal here is to use those subpopulation uh, that we ship to different investigators based on that topic. And then um, we have a bunch of uh, projects that span from the behavior to the metabolomic with every level of interpretation that you, you wish, photomics, epigenomics, microbiome, physiology, and to try to identify some of those biological markers. Um, how many minutes do I have, Paul? Uh, Abe? 
Uh, about five minutes left. Five minutes? Okay, all right. So I'm not gonna go uh, in details, but we, we have, uh, over the last year, we've published uh, um, a refinement of the behavioral model where we show that the animal that are vulnerable also increase their choice for cocaine when they are, um, when they have given the choice against a non-drug reward, so, so sucrose. That has been developed, it's a model that has been developed by um, um, Yavin Shah, Marco Veniro, and originally, particularly, uh, um, Serge Ahmed, uh, very powerful model to look at addiction that behave, behavior. Um, so we're very happy that the animals that are vulnerable, when they are uh, intoxicated with cocaine, they take a lot more, uh, they choose more cocaine than, than a non-drug reward. Um, so we, we talked about um, manuscripts. And so one of the strategies that we're using for manuscripts is that some of those cohorts that we are using, we are extending the, the, the behavioral paradigm for several days or weeks to do the study, right? To refine the, the behavioral paradigm and to test, for example, uh, compounds. So this is a collaboration with Amy Newman where we test the defect compound and we can test the, the effect size compared to um, the Prinofin methadone that tracks on. Um, we looked at electrophysiological measure, um, GABA transmission in the amygdala in those animals and found some interesting results. We shipped some samples to look at the physiology, looking at the pelvic floor muscle, um, uh, as apparently I didn't know about that, but there is a, a, an important interaction between opioid and, uh, and, and pregnancy and delivery. Um, We've done a lot of efforts with uh, also Christian Cheng with single cell RNA seq by comparing uh, human with opioid use disorder and our vulnerable versus resilient rats. And we've, she found that there is some very, very striking parallels between acute withdrawal and um, the, 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 the transcriptomic landscape during acute withdrawal in our rats compared to the, um, her human sample with opioid use disorder. Uh, we're now starting to do single, to do special transcriptomics also using those animals. So we're excited about um, being able to look at both the transcript, transcriptional landscape and the anatomical region. Doing some work also with Francesca Telese, where she's doing single cell RNA seq with single cell, single nuclei ataxic, um, again between cocaine and. Uh, vulnerable and resistant, and she found some some really cool results with Giordano uh, de Guglielmo with uh, GLO11, I think uh, GLO1, uh, the GLO1 gene uh, that Abe uh, uh, developed as a potential target for alcohol use disorder, and so it, there are some really cool um, interacting results here. Uh, we sent some samples also with Ryan Logan, who is also using uh, a sick and proteomics to try to compare human and uh, HS rats. Uh, we are looking at microbiome with Sierra Simpson. And she, she has been able to uh, identify feature in the microbiome that can predict whether the animal are vulnerable or resistant. And she was she's doing that using um, our rats, but also using existing database um, that have been already published. Um, she's also using uh, micro, uh, metabolomic approaches with uh, the Dorishtin lab to try to identify again feature in the metabolic in the in the blood that can pre that can predict um, whether they become vulnerable or resistant. And then the the final uh, the latest spin off project is developed by uh, Giordano de Guglielmo, who's trying to um, develop the GWAS approach and biobank approach for the alcohol field where he has been screening HS rats uh, um, using uh, the, the, the CAE model, which is the chronic intermittent exposure to alcohol vapor, uh, which is a gold standout in the field. And he has obtained some really cool uh, data with large individual differences. So I'm very excited that um, maybe in the future we'll have a, an alcohol GWAS. For the manuscripts, so again, because we, we try to diversify, it's difficult to publish the GWAS really quickly. So we need to run those studies in parallel um, um, to get some publication before the end of the five years. So we've done pretty good. Uh, and then we have 
as Abe said, uh, um, said it earlier, um, we submitted our renewal. I think we're one of the first, if not the first, you want to uh, resubmit their renewal. So what are we going to do is we're going to do same, the same general aims, right? We're going to be able to characterize the, those animals and do uh, GWAS, but then, uh, so it's very important that we keep the same overall experimental design so that we can increase the end of the animal and then completely change and not being comparable and have huge cohort effects. So we keep the same experimental design, but we do a lot more advanced behavior of phenotyping. And we're going to do that using uh, high throughput parallel video recording with automated machine learning analysis of the behavioral motives. And uh, I have to really thank Alex Smith from on Science. He was originally from the Kenny's lab and now he has his own lab, I think at MUSC. And he helped us set up uh, uh, the system where we can record the animal and identify those behavioral motifs um, that may be more sensitive to the genetic variants, right? Because uh, they are directly linked, uh, that they do not require any assumption from the investigator, uh, and it's a more rich behavioral analysis. And we were able already to show that the behavior of the animal in the chamber. Uh, before we even start the session can be used to predict whether an animal is vulnerable or resistant. So we are really excited about that. Um, Abe is going to also use advanced, uh, um, uh, it's going to use to, it, it will add structural variant analysis and FIWAS analysis of the behavior to improve the, the genomic part of it. And then we will expand um, the cocaine biobank uh, offering in infrastructure. So that's pretty much it. And thank you everybody, uh, particularly Giordano, Marcela, for the help in supervising those uh, GWAS and Lisa Maturan, uh, who's a biobank manager. And then finally, and most importantly, Molly Brennan, Brent Kumauer and Lani Thier, who are the one, the troop on the ground running those, those animals every single day of the year. And I am, will be forever uh, in depth of their work and they are fantastic. So thank you very much. <laughs>